Please note that in this recording, some of the questions may be inaudible, but the master's answers are audible and clear. Any question you'd like to ask? Okay. It is same thing. Same thing. Mind will experience the bliss, or soul will experience the bliss because they are together. The same thing. Yes. Master, you said that um, eventually we will see the radiant form of the master. Oh, sorry, we will see the master in everyone. Is that a manner of speaking? to describe a love and oneness, or will we eventually actually see the radiant form in everyone? You see, you see the Lord in everyone. I never said radiant form. You see, when you realize the Lord within yourself, then you see him in every part and parcel of this creation. Everywhere. That is om he's omnipotent important. Is it a love thing or a visual thing? Pardon? Is it just a love thing or just a visual sight? Well? Not a question of visual. It is <coughs> that knowledge and experience. You, you can't see him with your eyes. I mean, there's nothing that you can see with your outside eyes. No, I mean, the inner. It's the realization. Yes. Uh, the last couple of nights. Pardon? For the last couple of nights uh, here at Evening Satsang, it's been said that there is no free will. Absolutely. And I get the impression the way it's said that there is just no free will. Is, I, I'm just wanting to, to confirm that. Is it? <laughs> is there limited free will, or is there just no free will in our human experience? There is a free will and there is no free will. You see, from a higher point of view, there is absolutely no free will. Within a limited way, we have free will. Conditioned free will, limited free will. <coughs> As for example, we have no free will to be part of this creation. It is not that our will that we are here. It is His will that we are here. Where is the free will? Then, no doubt, karmic load is our own. We have no choice to select our parents, select our environments. Select in the, the atmosphere in which we are being brought up. Select our association and life. You have no choice. And they go all the way, condition our mind to act and think in a different, in a certain way. So, if you eliminate all that, you can say you have free will to act. If you also include all that, then your mind has already been conditioned by that atmosphere, by that environment, by your parentage, by your bringing up. You act accordingly. So you have no freedom. If we, only one who is free can have free will, how can a slave have any free will? We are not free. You are dominated by the mind. So how can soul have any free will? And mind is not free. Mind is dominated by the senses. How can mind have any free will of soul? So when you reverse the whole process, that soul controls the mind, and mind controls the senses, you are free. Your will is also free. 
No. You see, after the creation, in order to continue this creation, <laughs> mind was put. It, it is the outcome of the Maya <coughs> by Karl. So, in order to keep this creation going on, that is the design. Divine design, you can say it, and that is the whip in the Karl's hand. Is the mind by which he keeps all the souls tied down to this creation. Yes, well, Raj, there are a number of places in the Satmat books in which the image of water merging with water, the drop of the ocean, etc., is used, and there are other places where it is spoken of both in terms of the disciple and the master. Uh, living in the water like fish and enjoying its bliss. I was wondering if you could comment on There's not much difference. You see, you have many logs of wood, and from one end they are burning on. You put all the logs of wood together, there will be one fire. You cannot distinguish this part of fire belongs to this log, this part of fire belongs to this log of wood, it is the fire itself. Yet they have all different roots. Fire is one. So you are part, you see, in that divine drop of that ocean. Yes? I was reading that in uh, spiritual link of the booklet. Uh, had an Arabic proverb that said, um, as the dog barks, the caravan passes. Any idea what that means, or could you explain that? I think you see some dictionary. It doesn't do with Santmat. It's not a Santmat phrase. <laughs> you can say that the word will go on criticizing. And the lover of the Lord are indifferent to their criticism. Now go on moving on the path. You can make your own interpretation. And this is not a Sant phrase. Yes, Sant Mat Maharaj. Yes. Well, that is also, it is, I don't think the word, he has used these words here to describe his own way of thinking, but uh, these words are by somebody else. This is uh, some literary man, I've forgotten his name, he has used that phrase. Must have been written where it is written, they must have write down whose uh, sentence is this. It's an Arabic proverb. Ah, Arabic proverb, somewhere, that's right. Yes. This morning you said a rolling stone gathers no moss, and we were wondering what that referred to. Does it gather any moss? It doesn't gather no moss. Yeah. Hmm? A rolling stone, oh, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> rolling stone never gathers any moss. <laughs> You see, unless you are pinpointed towards Shabbat, you don't achieve much. If you are, let your mind waver, let me do this, let me do this, let me please Christ, let me please Buddha, let me please that, I don't want to annoy anybody. So there is no root in your faith what you are doing, and you don't make much progress at all. So we have to be one-pointed to the Shabbat and take our mind from the outside rituals and ceremonies and all that. In that reference I generally give this quotation. If you let your mind waver in every direction, you will not be able to achieve anything. Yes? guiding the person in his destiny, 
as the mind comes under the influence of the shuttle, is it possible that small variations in the karma can occur within the karmic framework towards the spiritual life? I'm not following your question. As the mind comes under the influence of shuttle, it will change. Attitude of the mind changes. So the destiny, the impulses from the mind, which are affecting the destiny, will also be changed. Yes, you see, as I said the other day, <coughs> sorry, it's not the events, it is our attitude towards those events which makes us happy and unhappy. Your attitude towards those events will change. Events won't change. Destiny remains the same. The same, you have to go through the same destiny. There's no question of changing the destiny, but your attitude changes to those events in life. Because if there's a change in destiny, destiny is interlinked with so many people, then all their karmas also have to be changed. It's interlinked. Our destiny is not independent. I was thinking, uh, let's say, a useless two hours with somebody. Recognize it, of course. You just put it aside. Also, linking karma to the local karma to gain more time. How do you know you see that uh, two hours is useless with that person? From where he may have come, how he may have come, and from where you happen to go there, and what made you talk that and bring you that situation to talk two hours which you are wasting? How do you account for all that? You see, you can't change all that. Destiny can't be changed. Its effect you won't feel much. Your attitude towards the, I mean, its effect will change. Yes. Sorry. Yes, yes. Maharaj, you, you said there's no free will. Uh, but now I'm curious, what, what is will itself? And what, what do you mean when you tell us to strengthen our willpower? Mind. Strong mind. Determined mind. That is what we have to Meditation will help you to do it. Yes. Is everything going to be just the same? What's the point of trying to be a better person? What is the sense of? Well, if everything's cut and dry, isn't it? What's the point of trying to um, be different? Is that in your hand? No. Then? What can you do? You see, if the Lord has given you hunger, won't you search for food? Then hunger is not in your hand. That is in His hand. Then now you have become helpless to search for food. You can't help it because you are hungry. If he doesn't give you hunger, you won't care for any food maybe around you. So that food is in the Lord's hand. When he gives that hunger, automatically we start searching. You are hungry, food is in the plate, your hands automatically start moving. <clears throat> yes. I read a quotation of yours, and if I understood it correctly, you said that a true lover of the Lord doesn't want to merge back with the Lord because the lover doesn't want to give up the yearning for the Lord. Did I understand? No, no, that's not the way I put it in any way. I say he is happy even in the pain of separation. He will not like to get rid of that pain of separation from the Father. No doubt what sacrifice he has to make for his love. How painful it may be the separation. Now he does in, under no caste he will like to part with it. He'd rather remain separate. No question of remaining separated. By his grace, if he pulls him to his level, it's okay. But he is not, you see. I mean, miserable that he is separated from him. Even that pain 
of separation he loves, he enjoys. He is not frightened of that pain, of the sacrifices which he has to go through. <coughs> Even that gives him certain sort of satisfaction and happiness. You see, a woman is not bothered with the pain, labor pains. She knows what she is going to get out of it. Same way. Yes. Is the destiny of a disciple of a perfect master perfect? Pardon? Is everyone that's initiated by a perfect master have a perfect destiny? What do you mean by perfect destiny? That the events of that individual's disciple's life will ultimately... Destiny is destiny. This is a comparative word, what is perfect, what is imperfect. But it will eventually merge into the master, the destiny of that soul? It's not the destiny. Destiny he would have to go through. But if he is marked, eventually he will definitely merge back into the divine love. How does an individual that's marked for that destiny then adjust their attitude? Marking is done by the Father. It's done by the Lord. But if the marked soul is going to merge into the Master, why is there a need to adjust the attitude? It automatically is adjusted. No question of adjusting the attitude. Okay, thank you. It is automatically adjusted. You see, it is not what you want to do. This is the outcome of the divine bliss within. But our attitude is automatically changed. Yes? Master, I noticed that your favorite word is automatically. <laughs> Everybody has some sort of favorite thing. <laughs> I'm glad I have only a, I'm an innocent word as it. <laughs> Well, my question is, if I, if I sometimes look at Satsangi who are initiated 20 or more years, I still see them subject from time to time to jealousy or a little bit of greed or a little bit of eating too much or things like that. <laughs> and I was wondering if this automatically means the whole lifetime. <laughs> Sister, we are all struggling souls. We are all struggling souls. Nobody is perfect. If we have been perfect, we would not have been here. The moment you become perfect, you won't be here. We are here because we are imperfect. So we are all struggling souls, trying to achieve to that height. So there is no question of criticizing or analyzing these things. <coughs> yes, Doctor? Samarani gives a story and tells of the Mr. Keys. I think it's called Eight, he gets saved. And it had to do with uh, Akbar. He was traveling in the forest. No, it wasn't in the forest, he was traveling. And uh, he saw a man, and when he saw that man, he had an impression uh, of immediate hatred. So he asked one of his aides to uh, ask that man what he felt about him. And not to be afraid because he was a king, but just answer what he felt. And that man said, I would like to pull out every hair on his head. Um, and then I think Akbar said, well, the saint, this is what the saints have said, that uh, it is just as the saints have said. Love begets love and hate begets hate. My question is, we often get into situations where we find someone bringing out the worst in us, and then we come into contact with people that bring out the best in us. How can we try to 
In modern science, in modern science, they call it telepathy. That is what they call it telepathy. Whatever you think within, another person also starts thinking within himself. Christ says, <clears throat> those who love you, you naturally love them. The beauty is to love them who hates you. Those who greets you, you automatically greet them. The beauty is to greet them who don't greet you. That is mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> So we have to take a positive step. Love begets love. Rather than think about hate, so begets hate. So let us love those, even those who hate, so that they also get love. Yes. Pastor, how do you deal with the person who takes advantage of the love that you give him? Takes advantage of you, even after you've been very nice to him. What advantage he can take out of love? I'm sorry? What advantage he can take out of love? Oh, it just seems like sometimes that they aren't nice in return, or they may do something that is not pro you, or for you, to someone else, or... They may say something to someone else that they don't like you or something like that. But something like that, you can deal with something like that. I'm like, God, what is something like that? <laughs> you see, nobody can take advantage of anyone unless we want it. We are weak to them. So they take advantage of our own weaknesses. If we are strong, they won't take advantage of it. <coughs> yes? Minister, if we offend someone in anger and we are not evolved enough to apologize, do we have to come back another time and deal specifically with that particular soul or can something else... Sister, these minor things don't bother much. Only those desires are those karmas and those karmic relationships which creates groove on our mind. Constant groove on our mind. They pull us back. These things come and go, they fade out. But those things which persist in your mind remain constantly in your mind. They slowly and slowly start making groove on your mind. Deep desires, deep revenge, deep hatred, deep love, they pull you back. Uh, meditation will change our attitude towards those things also in time. Change our? Meditation will change our attitude towards those things also in time. Naturally, automatically it changes. <laughs> yes. In the book, In Search of the Way, there's a quote that you had said, and if I don't say this correctly, please forgive me, but it is said that, that interest in Nam is generated by constant contact with the Master in every possible way. How do we reconcile this? Sister, I have said so much for the last 30 years, I have been saying something or another. I don't know in what reference I may have said anything. It's very difficult for me to remember what I have been saying. But uh, whenever you talk, there is always a certain reference to certain discussion, certain subject. You make certain statements. You can't pick up a line or two and start building over it. You have to read the whole context to know what you said and what I meant. Yes? Is it possible for a struggling soul to experience any kind of contentment in this world until they begin to feel a part from within or going from? Sister, we should feel content 
in this life, whether we go inside or not. Contentment is to accept what the Lord gives us with gratefulness, whether we like it or whether we dislike it. That is contentment. just to be receptive to what He gives and not demand what we want, but to accept what He gives, that is content. And meditation helps you to become receptive to that acceptance. And then contentment you definitely experience. <clears throat> yes? Master, could you explain what the fifth element ether is? We know the sense of sense of discrimination. Back to her question. So all the things that happen to us are just our destiny. And those are the things that we should be grateful for. What is the question? It, I'm wondering if, I, if that statement is accurate. I'm not following you. Sorry, I'm not following your question. Destiny. Is it an accurate definition of destiny? Just all the things that happen to us, all the circumstances and situations we find ourselves in. Is that destiny? You see, destiny is with something with which you are born, which you are going to go through in your life. That is destiny. That doesn't mean that we don't prepare ourselves for those events of life which we are destined to face. That doesn't mean that. We know summer has to come, winter has to come. We can't change the course of summer and winter weather. But if with our little effort we prepare ourselves for summer, we can have ice and fan and air condition, coolers. You see, the events will pass off, summer will pass off, and we won't be miserable. And same way, when the winter comes, if we have all little effort, we have facilities of heater and all that, winter will pass away. And we don't shiver. You can't change the course of weather, but you can adjust yourself to that weather. And that is contentment. Yes? I heard a story of someone who was very strongly emotional about being with you inside and they went in and in an attempt to come back they had some fear of coming of not being able to come back into the body is this because of that emotional uh, effort that was used to go in or what would cause fear for not being able to come back so where did you hear it is it guest house gossips? No. <laughs> How do you know that that person was there watching the other person who was experiencing all that? What do you mean? These are just made up stories. They have no base. Sorry. You said that. When we meditate, it changes our attitude. So, okay, I understand. I, in looking at my life in this time, I can see that almost all of the pain that I had to go through were caused by my own mind, my poor attitude. And once those attitudes started changing, so did the pain. Was it in my destiny to have a bad attitude and cause myself so much emotional pain? Why do you worry whether you have achieved it or whether it was destiny? Why do you worry? It's a good thing and good thing. 
Why should you analyze, try to analyze these things? If you go on dissecting everything, it will lead you nowhere. Yes? I kind of like to go back to the question that was asked, like, when you feel that people do not particularly like you, and let us say that it's in a working situation where you're kind of trapped with them. Uh, I have, okay, I want to ask if my attitude, if this is okay too. My attitude is that I feel that if somebody does not like me, then I do not want to, I try to stay away from them. I will be polite to them. Uh, if our work requires us that we, you know, have to do something together, then I will be efficient and hold at my end of whatever the work may be. But since I don't care whether they like me or not, is it okay just to just give them their space? Absolutely and, okay. You know? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yes. Uh, a few days ago, I was touring the deep temple Dhammika, and there's a in their history in their uh, museum. They have history on the picture, and uh, between many atrocities that were committed at that time, brutal slave uh, groups of the thing, brutal slaying, so people were tortured very much. Yeah. In the deep, okay, in the deep district, which I am in after the rules. And what I was thinking on, and there were many martyrs for faith, so to speak. What I was wondering, what sort of an attitude, um, what would you want the disciple to do if the worldly situation changed as much that those conditions would be there? What would, they do? What would you want the disciples to do? How many Christians have been crucified after Peter? How many people died in the name of religions? How many people have been killed in the name of religion? That is the fate of everywhere. You see, when Christians came in power, how many they killed? People who didn't believe, for example, you see those, uh, those who had a different views from them about Christianity. Even they were all eliminated. But suppose the organized, <coughs> suppose the time would come again and organized religion to persecute such groups as we, Sassami. What would you want Sassami to do? Let the time come. <laughs> Why are you frightened about that? Hmm? You see, this is the fate of. What, what did Christ do when he was being crucified? What to say of his disciple? What was his fate? What he has to go through? What Shamastri, um, the Tibrais had to go through? What Sarmad had to go through? What to say of their disciples? This is unfortunately the history of this world. We always worship the dead and persecute the living. That is the fate of all mystics and lovers of the Lord. Yes. Why is that that pressure is itself? Pardon? Why is it that that uh, hatred is there amongst all <laughs> of the great saints? What was so offensive that they can be persecuted? You see, it touches the pocket of the organized priestly class. Why was Christ court martialed? Call it court martial by the Romans. Why were Jews perturbed when he went to their synagogue? He turned out their tables. He says, you have made the house of God a place of merchandise. You have commercialized this house of God. Naturally, 
Let us their packet. So they won't tolerate. Nobody will tolerate. It is their business. So no organized religion tolerates the mystics. Then crucified, you see, on the charge of that they are corrupting the corrupting the public, corrupting the masses. There is so much, so yes, that was Christ's part. He didn't want to rule the world. He didn't want to become a king. He didn't want any money. He didn't want any power. And why didn't they like him? What was his fault? Same way. What was Sarbat's fault? In what way he was coming in confrontation with the Muslims, priests? Because people started following him. And they could not tolerate that people don't come to the mosque and they're running after him. So this is the fate of every mystic. Yes? Master, uh, would it be proper or, uh, for a young satsangi, say that someone coming to, to uh, refuse uh, uh, military service where one would have to kill somebody in combat? Well, being in the country, how can you refuse? How can you refuse the law of the country? You are a part of certain chain. And you can't break that chain. Well, I think sometimes I'll get one back in the office. Yes, and you, I mean, you should do your best. That's what you do. Even Babaji was in the army, even the great master was in the army. Well, if you have no intention, his grace is also there. <coughs> Does the grant so he teaches uh, you have to have a living master? Pardon? Does the grant so he, the book, does that teach that you have to have a living master? It is nothing but all what we talk about every day in the Granth Sahib. How much we follow, that is for us. There is nothing which is not there which we follow. And there is nothing which is there, which we don't follow. Same thing about the Bible. Same thing about the works of all the other mystics, <coughs> Persian mystics. You see, spiritual truth is same. Spiritual truth at the base of every religion is same. And mystics and saints only come to share with us their spiritual experiences, spiritual truth. They don't come to create any religions or to arrest us in some organizations. They don't come for that. Neither they break them nor they create them. We people, after their demise, try to arrest their teaching into certain organization and slowly and slowly their organization becomes very strong and gets into the name of a religion. The reality is lost, the shell is left. Ritual and ceremonies and dogmas are left. The reality is vanished. Reality vanishes. That is the fate of every religion. It's not the fault of those preceptors, those mystics and saints, they gave pure, simple spiritual teachings. But we <coughs> become more interested in the code of living, Sharia, rather than Hakikat, the reality. We become slave of the code of living, not of the slave of the reality, of, this, of the truth. So saints are only concerned with the reality, with the spiritual truth. They are not concerned with the code of living. 
whether you follow their teaching by being a Christian, by, by being a Muslim, by being a Hindu or a Sikh, it's immaterial to them. But they are only interested that you should be Christian, you should be Muslim, you should be Hindu, you should be Sikh. What you do is your job. They don't bother. They are only worried about the clocks. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if the jiva is powerless to change, how can change? If, if the jiva is powerless to change, his efforts serve only as a supplication <laughs> to the master, the mercy, so that uh, the master in his mercy <laughs> might change or alter. You see, this world, powerless to change, means that he is putting all his effort. Jiva is putting all his efforts, but still he is powerless to change. As I say that if you cannot bring your success, at least bring your failures. Failures we only bring when we make an attempt. If we don't make an attempt at all, then, then there's no chance even of success. So human failings are there when we try to achieve anything. Failure may be a part of success. But if we won't put an effort at all, then we can never succeed. When the child starts learning to run, he falls so many times. But since he's determined, ultimately he succeeds. So on the path also we flatter so many times, we fall so many times. But if we are determined, then those failures become pillars of strength to us to achieve their success. But ultimately it's up to him to give us any change. But you want to. No, I mean, you see, you that is for the Lord's grace. He is putting his best. Now it is for the Lord to reward his effort. One can only put sincere effort. The result is not in his hand. That is in Lord's hand. I had a second question. Yes. Uh, are there certain blue brains, lifelong karmic patterns that never change in an individual till they cross the second stage or till the master intervenes um, that protect the individual from? Either in uh, changing from wrong patterns of thinking, a wrong way of doing children, and so forth. I think to some extent that's right. That is right. Certain characteristics of humans never change, even in the next birth, because we carry the past impressions in the next birth. We carry the past characteristics we in the next birth. So there's not much change in them. The real change only comes when we go beyond the realm of Thirkuti. But definitely they start changing for the better slowly and slowly. But general, normal characteristic of a person doesn't change much. Even in the next birth. That's the Hmm? Is that a Yes, that's right. Prakriti, nature. Yes? But the moment means the or the and sister go simultaneously. When we sit in a proper meditation, Simran and Dhyan should go simultaneously. Because both faculty of the mind has to be occupied. Faculty to visualize, faculty to think. They both have to be occupied by these similar and the concentration for the similar is actually the or the I say that both have to be done simultaneously. 
Simran will help you to withdraw. You see, from the time of purchase to the eye center. And Dhyan will help you to stay there. To hold your attention there. Both have to go together. Yes. At what point in a spiritual process does an individual get perfect shop knowledge and perfect shop control? At what? At what point in one's spiritual progress, like first region or so forth, does one individual get perfect self knowledge and perfect self control? Perfect self self knowledge. Well, you know, wherever we are able to realize ourselves, only there perfect self knowledge can be. And we can only realize about ourselves when we go beyond the realm of mind and maya, <coughs> when we go beyond Tirkuti. And uh, self control at the same point or earlier? Self? Self control. Self control we can have earlier, much earlier. Earlier. Hmm. You see, when mind becomes friend, then you have self control. Then you have control over your, you see, senses. When it becomes your friend, as long as it is your enemy, it's rebellious, then you are slave of it. And when it becomes your friend, then it becomes your best guide to take you back to its own destination. Thanks. Yes? So how do we make the mind our friend? Pardon? How do we make the mind our friend? Just by meditation. Attaching it to the Shabda and Naam within. Master, in your Niyan, what happens if you start researching parts of your face at a time, like your forehead and your eyes, and then maybe your nose and your mouth, but not the whole face together? Sister, we should try to visualize the general face and don't try to analyze the nose or the eye and this part or that part, otherwise, you'll be lost. General face. Yes. Uh, our sixth color is such a nature that that is not only becomes the cabin bin and our remedial hell, but also can a sixth color be called be caused by, say, a deep association with someone else who may maybe a fire a long time? I'm not following your question. Well, same thing, there's no difference in them. Sanskara means you see impressions of your last life on your mind. Whether you call it desires of the last life, because those desires are being fulfilled now. You see, this, our very existence proves our past desires. The very existence of this creation proves, you see, about, of, of our past desires. Past karmas. Could this also mean that if one gets a very strong impression about a past desire, that would help the search for that desire to be over? So whether it is a deep desire or desire on a root, on the surface, that's a different thing. But desire is a desire. But as I told you last day, that our many desires just fade out. They become meaningless to us during our very lifetime. Certain desires we are so anxious to achieve, they become absolutely meaningless and fade out during this very life time. Yes? In the book I am reading, Liberation of the Soul, it says that there are only two categories of people, Gurumus and Manmus, <clears throat> and that a servant always stays a servant. Now I wonder. Can you change from one category to the other? That's what we are trying to. Mm-hmm. But uh, is that only possible with the grace of the master, or is it 
There's not much difference. We only put an effort by the grace of the Lord. <clears throat> we put our effort to meditation only by His grace. Manmukh, you see, who is attached to the creation. Gurmukh is one who is attached to the Creator. Manmukh is trying to achieve this creation, its object faces. Gurmukh is trying to achieve the Creator. And as Christ said, Manmukh is building a treasure in the world. Gurmukh is building a treasure in heaven. And, then, and they are both created by Him. 